Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14. When you found the text, if you would stand in honor of the reading of God's Word, see that we're not like some churches that have you doing calisthenics during the entire service. You know, stand up, sit down, kneel down, stand up, sit down, kneel down. I don't know whether I'm hearing a preacher or if I'm hearing Jane Fonda. But Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14, this is a wonderful portion of the Scripture. I think you're going to be excited by today's message. And the word of the Lord reads, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him through all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as his custom was. He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and gave it, he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we love you today, and we're so grateful, God, for every single opportunity that you give us to come into the house of God and be blessed. We're grateful, God, that we're able to come into this place and recharge our batteries so that the week to come can be a blessed week and a happy week. Master, we're grateful today for all that you've done for us, not only in this past week, but in the past month and in the past year. And Lord, as we express thanksgiving at this time of year, we express thanksgiving even yet once again now. Master, as the bread of life is about to be broken, the most important meal of our week, we ask God that your anointing and your presence would reside upon this preacher. Lord, that you might help me to deliver your word in a fashion that will bring honor and glory to your name. For we ask it, O oh God, in none other than the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. We started our text up tonight, this afternoon, reading the words, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. You see, if you'd have read the few verses just before what we read for our text tonight, you'd understand that the Lord had just come away from His temptation in the wilderness by the enemy. But you know, there's one wonderful thing about every time the devil tries to stretch our band, and every time the devil tries to test our steel and see what we're made of, there's something wonderful that happens. And that is that we wind up coming away from the experience, A, victorious, B, glowing, amen, and three, in the power of the Spirit, amen. So every time the devil comes against you, children, don't get upset, don't get discouraged, keep your eyes on the Lord, victory's ahead, and when it's all said and done, you'll be better for it. Can you say amen? Amen. And I want you to know that the Lord was coming away from a wonderful victory as Satan had tried to tempt him. And he came away with a, a very positive, empowered mindset and attitude, and he went into the place he grew up. 
Now, what does the Bible say about the place you grew up? The Bible said a prophet is not without honor except in his own country amongst his own folks. Of course, that's a paraphrase. You know, that's from the first Southern Bible. <laughs> so you see, a prophet, everybody loves a prophet except the folks he grew up around. Because they'll look at you and say, well, I know you, man. I know where you grew up. I know where you come from. Who are you to say that? And who are you to say this? And who are you to tell me that? Well, of course, that was a lot of his experience in the area that he grew up in. But it was so interesting because when the Sabbath came, the Lord found his way into the temple as, or the synagogue as he always would. And the Bible says that he volunteered to do the reading for the day, and he opened the book of Isaiah. And he found a certain portion of the scripture. Notice it doesn't say that he just inadvertently kind of looked down and boom, there it was in front of him. He knew what he was reading, and he knew why he was reading it. Amen. Purpose is important in life. If you don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it, then children stand still because chances are you're doing the wrong thing. Do you know what I'm saying? Purpose is important. The Lord understood his purpose in life. He knew what he was here to do. He knew what his life was all about from the get-go. He knew. And it's imperative today that we understand the purpose of the gospel because it's not just Jesus who had that purpose but we share it as well amen we share the same exact purpose that he had now we don't have the same job that he had thank God but we have the same purpose amen and he shared the purpose of the gospel in this portion of scripture that I read to you this afternoon, or I read with you this afternoon, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because. The purpose, what's the reason? Why? What's the purpose? Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I want you to know, children, Jesus Christ was manifest as our example, and we cannot today possibly do more than he did, but neither should we be guilty of doing any less. The church is called today to uh, walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit, to be empowered by the Spirit. Why? What is the purpose? So that we can be anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Do you hear me today? So that we can be anointed to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and so that we too might be anointed to set at liberty them that are bruised so that we might be anointed to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. In Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. The apostles declared in Acts chapter 4 and verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Amen. They can only preach and tell about the things which they had seen with their eyes and heard with their ears. And somebody must have been in the synagogue this day when Jesus opened this portion of Scripture and read it for those who sat and listened. And when he declared this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Somebody must have been there to hear that. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ was eternally unique, meaning nobody before him nor anyone after him has ever had that same ministry. He was the fulfillment and realization of every Old Testament prophetic word ever written. In this passage, which we read this afternoon, 
which the Lord himself read aloud in the synagogue, the specific nature and purpose of the Lord's ministry is clearly outlined. Number one, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he said. You see, our efforts today are in vain if the Spirit of the Lord does not go before us. If we do not have the anointing and the blessing and the empowerment of God's Spirit, then children, there's no sense in our even trying to do it. Whatever task we might be thinking about doing, God anoints or He cloaks His messenger with His very own presence so that the hearer may know that the message indeed originates with him. Did you know that's what the anointing is? The anointing is when God takes his very own presence and he causes it to reside upon the messenger so that when you hear the message, you're not hearing the messenger, but you're hearing God, and you know you're hearing God. Amen? When the preacher gets up and preaches, if the anointing of the Holy Ghost is upon him, you're hearing the word as though it's coming from God, and you're not really paying that much attention to who's delivering it. Amen. And that's why some of these uh, Hollywood preachers we got out there on television land nowadays, you know, up there on TBN and all this foolishness, everybody wants to be a personality. Everybody wants to be a big shot. Everybody wants to be uh, somebody that everybody in the world knows. When in reality, the Word of God, I like what, what John the Baptist said. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. Oh God, let me ever be mindful that the Word of God is far more important than me. Hallelujah. If you walk away and remember this message today and don't remember who gave it to you, that's all right. Just remember the Word. Hallelujah. That's the important thing to take away. Glory to God. I used to have folks when I was pastoring my first church years ago thrill me to death when they would come to me months later and say, Brother Mara, remember when you preached? And then they, they named the message, the title of the message. Remember when you preached thus and so? Well, yeah, I do. Well, you know, you said thus and so, and then they start rattling off half the message. And I sat there and I said, well, you know what? Lord, I must not be that bad a pastor. Amen. I hear a lot of people talking about going to church, and the only thing they remember is about the last thing that happened before they nodded off. <laughs> so if these folks could remember so much of what I said, that had to be a high compliment. But, you know, it was more important what I said than the fact that I said it. Are you understanding me? And I always want the anointing because the anointing causes me to diminish. Do you know when you come against the demon spirit and that thing comes up and, and someone's demon possessed and, and they're in the church house or wherever you might be and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord will anoint you to cast that demon out of that person. And as you begin to come against that spirit in the name of Jesus Christ, guess what? They're not seeing you. They're seeing Jesus Christ. And they know they got to listen to him. Because God will cloak you with his own presence so that the hearer knows it's God talking and not yourself. Hallelujah. Well, isn't that good? Amen. I'm starting to get happy. Christy, you might see some stuff today. <laughs> This preacher, I only wear the robe because we got a lot of folks come to church and like to look at the preacher rather than listen to the message. That's why I wear my robe, is to get your eyes off of me and get you to listen to what I'm saying. It's the only reason I wear the robe. But don't let the robe fool you. Down inside, underneath here, is a good old time apostolic Pentecostal preacher. I'll tear up to running up and down this aisle any minute if I get happy. I just look like a woman in a wedding dress doing it. <clears throat> There's something about that anointing, that empowerment of the Spirit, which is why Jesus read the words. 
the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I wasn't just sent to preach the gospel. I wasn't just sent to do all this. No, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to give me this purpose, to give me the ability to do what I've got to do. Because if the Spirit of the Lord isn't there, then my efforts are in vain. Luke chapter 4, verses 32 through 36, you'll notice this is the same chapter that we just read from. Our primary text, the Word of God reads, And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Woo! That's enough to put the shout in your spirit right there. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this! For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. Hallelujah. You know why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Hallelujah. That's why. Glory to God. And if you think this preacher isn't qualified or able to cast demons out, bring me somebody and I'll show you. Amen. Honey, I've had to do it in very, very recent years. I've had to cast demons out of people. My uncle married a woman in Pennsylvania. And I told my grandmother our first time we ever went down to meet her. I'd never met her before. And we went down there for Thanksgiving one year, coming home. My grandmother said, so what do you think of this woman? And I said, she's fine, but she's demon possessed. My grandmother Pentecostal. Remember what I said, a prophet's not without honor except in his own house. Remember? <laughs> well, her reaction was, oh, good grief. I said, Grandma, she is. That girl's got demons. She's got serious problems with, with demonic activity. To make a long story short, two years later, I'm down in Pennsylvania trying to do a work in her community where this girl lives, where she and my uncle live. I could not visit with my uncle for more than two minutes without her coming out saying, Oh, Philip, we've got to go somewhere. We've got to do something. we got to, you know. She constantly was interrupting us so that we could not spend time together. I never stepped a foot in their house. And I knew why. I said, see, them old devils don't want me in there because they're afraid they're going to get themselves licked if, if I get in there. That's what the problem is. They know they're going to have a problem. So one day, finally, my uncle... He and I were trying to visit while he was working on a car out in the, in the garage, and I noticed his door was open, so I stopped to visit with him. And she came out with one of those, Oh, Philip, we need to go do something, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he said, Woman, shut up. That I haven't visited with my nephew in the longest time. He's been living here now for months, and I haven't had a chance to visit with him. He and I are only a year and a half apart in age. He said, Just be quiet. He said, We're going to visit. So after a while, we go in the house and we're visiting, and Philip said, by the way, there's something I need to talk to you about. He said, a lot of weird stuff been going on around this house. I said, like what? He said, well, we've got noises, doors opening and closing. He said, things are happening. He said, it's strange. He said, kind of spooky. He said, we even tried to videotape it. He said, I put a videotape up on top of the refrigerator, and we left the house for a couple of hours. He said, and when I came back, he said, you should see what we got. He said, would you watch it? If I showed it to him, I said, sure I will. He put the videotape on and it began to play. He said, now mind you, nobody's in the house. Nobody. He said, the house is empty. So okay, they had a private home. Orbs of light are flying all over the place. You see it on the film. The refrigerator door is opening, remaining open for anywhere from three to four to five minutes. Even if you were a person in the house, you're not going to go in your house, open the door for three, four, five minutes. But you'd hear the door open. You know that sound when the refrigerator, you know, opens? And then you'd hear the, the, the motor come on from the fan to, you know, the compressor and all that. And it'd be running and running and running and running and running and running. You'd see the light from the door having open. And then after so many minutes, all of a sudden, kaboom, that door would slam shut. 
he said, this has put me to death. So then we're listening, we're listening. And after a while, I'm sitting there, and I started leaning in toward the TV. And Philip says, you hear it too, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. It sounded like a group of people talking. But at a very, very low level, but you could hear it plain, but it was at a low level. And it just sounded like a crowd of people talking. And uh, I said, Philip, I know what the problem is. I said, I, I know what the problem is. I said, if you want me to, I can go through the house. I said, I can perform an expulsion. That's why I take my anointing off. I anoint every wall in the house. I anoint the front and back of every door. I anoint every closet. I anoint the front and back of the closet doors. I said, and I tell the devil he hadn't got a hiding place that this home is, is uh, welcomes only the presence of God and he has no welcome here. I said, and then when I'm all done and I get through the entire house, I go to the front door, open the door, and I command the spirits to leave in the name of Jesus, and they do. He said, by all means, do it. So I went upstairs, started out in his upstairs bedrooms. I was doing upstairs bedrooms when I began to hear his wife screaming like somebody was stabbing her to death down on the first floor. By the time I finally got the upstairs bedrooms and the bathroom done, and I began to climb down the, to the stairs, to the downstairs, Philip's dragging her to the bottom of the stairs saying, Chuck, can you pray for her? He said, something's going on with her. And I said, I sure can. See, I knew. I said, thank you, Jesus. See, that devil was being chased out, and he didn't like it. I knew the demons weren't with the house. They were with her. But I knew that I could get them agitated if I started expelling them from the house. So I turned around. I took my anointing oil, and when I went to anoint her with all, she looked at me and began to scream, with the most hideous, high-pitched, seemed like it would never end. No, that I'd ever heard. Put that all on her forehead, laid my hand on her head, said, you old devil, come out of her in Jesus' name. She fell to the floor. I got up over her and began to pray, over, not pray over her, but to cast those demons out and to call them out by name, because I'll tell you what, God will tell you what's there. Amen. Anybody stupid enough to tell you, you've got to have a conversation with demons, they're wrong. If you haven't got any more discernment than that, you don't need to be trying to cast demons out. And the Spirit of the Lord began to show me there was a spirit of pain in her. There was a spirit of anger in her. And various things, just a whole pile of things. And I began to call them out one by one. You old spirit of pain, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of this woman. And kept going. It kept, took like two hours. But when we got done, she was delivered. You know why? Because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. Amen. He doesn't just send you out there ill-equipped and ill-prepared. He sends you out there with purpose, and he sends you out there with power. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. The word of the Lord declares that in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 7, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Then said I, Our Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I send thee. And whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. That's why the anointing is so important. That's why having a purpose. That's why when preachers come to me and they want to preach in my pulpit and I haven't got a clue that if God ever called them to preach, it ain't going to happen. Amen. Because if the Lord hadn't called you to preach, you hadn't got any right being behind the pulpit. Amen. I know I'm telling the truth. If God hadn't called you, honey, you have no purpose. There's no reason for you to get behind the pulpit. Jeremiah was called and ordained before he was born. Amen. I want to know that I have that my calling is sure, don't you? Don't you want to know that God called you? Don't you want to know when you get up in the and to do the work of God that He's called you to the work that He's called you to, whatever that may be? But you don't even have to be a pastor if he's called you to, to clean toilets. Don't you want to know that God's called you to that? Don't you want to know that God is behind you in your efforts? 
John chapter 15, verses 14 and 15, Ye are my servants, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard, all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. And in Jeremiah, hear God say, listen, whatever I tell you, that you say. And Jesus was saying, everything I've heard, I've said. I've delivered everything to you that the Father has told me to tell you. Therefore, because the Lord has delivered every word that the Father wanted us to hear, for that reason, we can no longer are we called servants, but men. Because we are subject to full revelation. God's made his full revelation known unto us. Therefore, we're not his servants. We're not, we're not servants. We're his friends. Now, if you do it, you do it because you want to do it. Now, if you do it, you do it because it's the right thing to do. Amen. Zechariah 4 and 6. Then he answered and spoke unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. You see, Laura, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. You know why? Because God don't do it by might. He doesn't do it by power. He does it by His Spirit. That's why I need His Spirit on me. That's why you need His Spirit on you. Mark chapter 16 and verse 20, And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the Word with signs following. You know why so many of our modern-day Pentecostal churches or a lot of these charismatic churches, you know why they don't have any signs following? They're so busy pushing people over that nobody's ever genuinely slain in the Spirit. Amen. You know why? They're not preaching the Word. That's why. Amen. Did you hear me? See, they put the emphasis on the wrong part of the service. It's in whether or not people fall over when they pray for you. It's whether or not people are shouting while we're having worship. It's whether or not this is happening or whether or not that is happening. No, it isn't. It's whether or not you're preaching the Word. If you preach the Word, the signs will follow because God always confirms His Word with signs following. My Lord, have mercy. It's kind of an unusual message today, isn't it? Listen to the next part of our purpose, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel. That's not very finished. He said, to the poor. Most churches are buying for the wealthy and the successful to build their church memberships and coffers. But the truth of God works in direct contrast to the ways of men. God's truth brings salvation, and salvation brings prosperity, blessing, and beauty. The Jewish nation had a long tradition of despising the poor within its ranks, and even today it is much the same within the church of God. Amen. Am I telling the truth today? You come in and you're rich, and old T.D. Jakes will hug the fire out of you. You come into his church and you're poor, and honey, you'd be lucky if you can ever even say his name close enough to him for him to hear you. And I'm, you think I'm telling a joke? Go talk to some of the people that belong to his church. Go find out who the people are that sit in the preferred pews up front, which are reserved for those who give the most. That's the way they do it over there, I understand. Somebody told me that who goes there. I'm not, this ain't second hand. Oh, well, you know, those folk in our church who did the most, I said, my God, you know, I remember the apostle telling us in Scripture that that was an abomination, and that, that kind of action was a sin. To prefer those who came into your fellowship, who were wearing fine clothing, who were wearing big rings, and who obviously had great wealth. He said, if you prefer that one over the poor one, you're committing a sin. My Lord, have mercy. But this is what's going on in the church today. Because men aren't trying to build the kingdom of God. They're trying to build themselves a reputation. They're trying to build themselves a business. You know why, Christy, Brother Morrow can come here every Sunday and preach regardless of how many we got? Because it's not a business to me. It's a calling. 
God called me to it. God hadn't called me to this no way in the world I could do what I do. But I do it because God called me to it, and we're going to keep going for Jesus till this thing blows up and we have a church full of people and we've got to go out and break some ground and build our own. Amen. But you know what? It'll never have my name on it. When I started my affirming ministry in 1993, I said, Okay, Lord, if I'm going to start ministering in an affirming fashion, I need a name to minister under because I will not have my name. I will not use Charles Morrow Ministries, Jimmy Swagger Ministries, Kenneth Hagen Ministries, Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Such a proud, conceited, ungodly heathens is what I think a lot of them are. How dare you put your name out there like you're something? I said, Lord, you better tell me if I said, you better give me a name that I can use. He said, okay, Grace Oasis, because that's what you're going to preach. You're going to preach the grace of God as an oasis for humanity, including GLBT people. I said, okie dokie. So Grace Oasis Ministries was born. Amen. But not one time did I do anything in my own name. I can't. I, I don't believe that way. I never had, never will. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I want you to know today that the Lord reaches out for the challenged. Because he is a God who knows that note that there is no challenge he cannot conquer. Bring in the poor. Bring in the drunkard. Bring in the addict. Bring in the destitute. And I will save, restore, deliver, and heal, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, Lord Jesus, fill our church up today with a bunch of drug addicts. Hallelujah. Send us some prostitutes. Uh, glory to God. Give us a few drunkards. Oh, Lord, send us the poorest ones you got. Because the offering basket doesn't matter, but the souls of men do. Matthew 5, 3 through 6, part of the Lord's great Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I want you to know, there are no restrictions on that message today. He didn't say you had to be straight and hunger and thirst for righteousness. He didn't say you had to be church of God and hunger and thirst after righteousness. He said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We're here today because we're hungry, and God said you're blessed today because you seek, and you will find. Whew, Psalm 149, verse 4, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek, with salvation. So send me the worst you got. Amen, devil. Send the worst you got. Send the ugliest pile of humanity that ever walked into a church. God will save them, fill them with the Holy Ghost, hallelujah, and he'll make them so pretty you won't even recognize them anymore. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Praise God. I know he does. I know God does it. I've seen it. I've seen some ugly scooper poopers come into the church. I tell you what, I've seen some scary characters come into the house of God. And the Spirit of the Lord get a hold of them and change their life and set them free. And all of a sudden, glory, you've got some pretty people. Amen? But the message of the gospel is fivefold in nature. How dare any preacher claim to be representing Jesus Christ or the gospel for which he died? by occupying God's sacred desk and then beating and bashing God's people to a pulp. How dare you? And look at the, the, the nature of the gospel message. He had sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The Lord knows your frame of mind. He knows your emotional state. He knows not only your situation, but how you feel about it. Hallelujah. The ministry of the gospel is to introduce healing to the emotional aspects of our human makeup as well. Many people's hearts are broken by many different things. They've lost loves, 
they've uh, experienced the death of loved ones, or they've experienced great disappointment, or great uh, serious distress or trauma. And the message of the grace of our God will heal every one of them. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm almost done, believe it or not. The gospel message, part of our purpose in the gospel message is to preach deliverance to the captives. One may be captive in that they have been imprisoned by men. And that may be right or wrong. Amen. There's some in jail that belong there, and there's some there that don't. One may also be a prisoner to their own mind. If you believe yourself to be a slave, you'll behave like a slave. I recently saw a, a, a movie on TV where this young black man was with a white man, and the young white man was caught by Union soldiers. He was a southern boy, and the young white boy was caught by Union soldiers, and the, the uh, Union soldiers told the black man, well, now you're free, son. Go. You're free. And he looked at them, and he didn't know what to do. And the white man that he had been traveling with said, Go and tell my father that I've been captured. Now I want you to take a wild guess at which of those words that black man followed. That's it. Because that was his master. You see, he was still a slave in his mind, even though the Union soldiers had just declared, Honey, the Union has just marched down your path, and now you're free. Go, you're free. Go. But no, he was still a slave in his mind. And when that white boy that had been his master for all those years said, Go and tell my father, that's what he did. Went right back into bondage. I've got news for you. The gospel of Jesus Christ today, part of our purpose is to preach deliverance to the captives. It's, woo, it's to let those, Laura, who think that they're captive, who think that they're a slave to something, but they're really not. We're to let them know you have access to God. You've got a right to come to God. GLBT people, come on in, children. There's room at the cross for you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. And recovering of sight to the blind. That's part of our gospel message. Physical blindness in biblical times was a state of hopeless despair. A blind individual was relegated to the very poorest state of existence. They'd have to live begging on from the side of the street. But a state of spiritual blindness in any age is a condition with which none should desire to live. And God has called us to preach the recovering of sight to the blind. Hallelujah. Honey, you don't have to live in the dark anymore because Jesus is the light of the world. Hallelujah. He has illuminated anything you want to know. He'll show you. Anything you need to understand, he'll help you. Praise God. Amen. And if we're doing our job right, we're not going to be a light, but we're going to be reflecting His light. Am I telling the truth? <sighs> Too many preachers preaching that Christians are supposed to be the lights themselves. The Bible said, you know, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. The city that set upon a hill cannot be hid. But children, I'll tell you what. You build a city in biblical times on the top of a hill that's going to be enough light to light the world, and uh, you're either going to be burning an awful lot of candles, or you're going to burn the city down. But you know what? If you build that city out of material that's reflective, then when the sun comes up, it'll reflect. And when the moon comes up, it'll reflect. God don't want his people to think they're Jesus. He just wants us to reflect Jesus. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. One cannot heal who yet remains captive to a trap. Did you hear me? One cannot heal who yet remains captive to a trap. Humanity has set many traps to which we as human beings fall victim. We frequently remain captive or trapped by these man-made or devil-inspired contraptions of deceit and bondage, 
And it takes the truth of God and the gospel of His grace to tear open the jaws of these satanic devices, thus allowing the wounded, cre the wounded, those who are wounded by these merciless devices to heal and mend. Amen. Laura, you know some people, they get something in their craw and it just touches them and they can't get past it. Amen. One of the things I have to do when I'm ministering to the gay community, I have to help people understand what the, the Bible genuinely, truly, honestly says about GLBT people. Now, I'd like to not even have to go into so much detail on all that, because I'm just busy preaching Jesus. I'm just busy preaching the gospel. But you know what? You've got to do that. You know why? Because that's how you open the trap, so they can get their foot out, and then they can begin to heal. Because as long as their leg is in the trap, they can't heal, can they? Amen. So you see, children... It's our responsibility, listen to what Jesus said, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Those that are in traps, they need us to open the trap and set them free so that they can receive their healing. And lastly, the Lord Jesus Christ said the purpose of the gospel, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Guess what he was talking about, guys? Jubilee! Jubilee! The gospel of Jesus Christ is nothing less than a declaration of jubilee. Hallelujah! Leviticus 25, 10 through 13, And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof, it shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family, and ju a jubilee that uh, shall that fiftieth year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat the increase thereof, out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. That's what we call restoration. Hallelujah. Everything you've lost, you've got a right to get back. Amen. And God said, when you go out and preach the gospel of grace, you're declaring jubilee. You're letting people know that they can be restored to those things which they have lost. Hallelujah. Isn't that exciting? So you see, Laura, from what I see, the gospel is good news. I don't know about some of these TV preachers, what they're preaching, and some of these preachers and some of the pulpits around town. I don't know what they're preaching, because everything I read is good news. And it's not good news for some, it's good news for all. Whosoever will, let him come. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Would you stand with me today? We're, today is a communion service, so I don't want to belabor the message. I wanted to get it out there to you as quick and concise as I could. I hope you got something out of it. Amen. Praise God and amen. I wonder if we would go ahead and how about if we do it this way? Why don't you come straight down today and stand across the front?